It's the final week end of the month. You know what that means. It's style study time. And today's video was actually picked by my amazing patrons as well as some of you guys on my Discord server from a poll I put up last week. Today we're going to take a look at the absolutely wonderful stylized high fantasy character concept art of Linnea Kikuchi. I hope I said that right. Um, better known by her online name, Fifel. This has been on my list forever because Linnea's style is one I've wanted to learn for a very long time, but it's truly her way of seeing the world and translating it into design elements and style that I truly covet. So hopefully in today's study, we can dive into that design bit a little more. If you're a style study veteran, thank you so much for coming back. I love you and you can go ahead and skip to part one time sensor in the description below. But if you're new here, hi, welcome. I'm so glad you're here because today we're gonna level up your art by like a million percent. Style Study is a regular series we do here on my channel where we take a look at some of our favorite contemporary artists, analyze their work and see what we can learn from it. Keyword, learn. We're not here to plagiarize anyone's work or copy their style. We're only here to learn some really cool art tips and tricks and see how we can apply them to finding our own unique art style. I usually structure my style studies in three parts. In part one, we'll take a look at Linnea's work, analyze her style and see what we can learn from it. Part two will be a study of one of her original paintings. The absolutely adorable reference I've chosen today is this one. And in part three, we'll apply everything that we learned today to an original painting of our own. Of course, if you enjoyed this video and learned something today, please do remember to like and subscribe. Comment below your biggest takeaway from this study and come say hello on Instagram and Discord. The links are down in the description below. Alrighty, now, if you're ready for the first time this year, grab a snack, sit back, and let's dive into another style study featuring FIFA. Linya Kikuchi, I hope I said that right, better known by her online name Fifel, I hope I said that right, is a Swedish Japanese artist based in Stockholm, Sweden. In interviews, she's mentioned how she grew up drawing and always knew she wanted to be an artist, and her introverted nature from a very young age meant that she had loads of time to practice her art. However, over time, the self-doubt kicked in to the point where she felt afraid to even show people what she drew. She even mentioned how she went to art school and also had just really bad experiences there. That was until one day on a whim, she decided to post her work on the internet. And very quickly, she felt part of a large online community that not only enjoyed her style, but also shared in her genre of interest. She said she much prefers the anonymity that sharing her work online allows her, particularly when it comes to receiving critique. Linya's incredible art has garnered her over 1.1 million followers on Instagram and over 265,000 followers on Twitter. Linnea's style is what I'd probably describe as highly stylized character concept art that is heavily inspired by nature. But it's like nature horror? So the characters look sort of adorable and humanoid, but they almost always represent an element of nature while also being spooky. What is really striking about Linya's work is the character design, how she translates the reference object into shape language that still maintains the integrity of her concept while also working as a believable character. There's some dramatic colors and strong silhouette, and these are the design aspects I wanna focus this study on because I do think we can learn a lot from Linya's work. Here's a fun fact, Linnea was actually big into drawing and painting traditionally. If you scroll far enough back on her Instagram, you'll see a lot of marker pieces, or my favorites, the watercolor illustrations. Oh yeah, Linnea used to be an aquarellist. Speaking of lists, here are four key characteristics to Linnea's work.
Like I said, my absolute favorite part about Linya's art is how she translates the inspiration into character design concepts. It is such a unique skill, but there are indeed some very noticeable themes that run across her paintings regardless of the reference. First, of course, pretty much all of her characters are inspired by elements of nature, but not just broad ideas like space or the sun, which of course you do see, but she also looks at individual species of mushrooms, literal cells and intracellular structures, an actual tooth, and also atoms. It's like if biology and art had a baby. What's fascinating, though, is the subtle subtext of horror. A lot of these concepts have dark undertones, like this hairy Mycena character that kind of looks like the classic little girl demons you see in horror movies, while other characters are just straight up macabre, like this piece inspired by the devil's finger mushroom. It's so interesting, because while these characters are very much stylized to be cute, like we'll see in a sec when we discuss the shape, language, and anatomy, there is still this cold undercurrent of creepy, shadowy aspects that kind of really mess with your head. I think this is because Linya actually plays with a very primal instinct that we're all born with. It is the hypervigilance that we're programmed to have when in the dark. As humans, we are very visual creatures, and so we really depend on bright daylight in order to feel safe. However, you know that feeling of things just looking a lot creepier at night? Like how a bright, sunny forest suddenly turns into an eerie scene in the moonlight? Well, Lania's work is kind of like that. She takes all these innocent elements of nature and recontextualizes them, so it feels like you're looking at them at night when they're just a little creepier. Generally speaking, you'll see a lot of these characters look humanoid, so there's very noticeably a head, a body, two arms and two legs, and for the most part their clothing is fairly believable. But then Linya throws in paranormal elements that really shove the concept in your face, like a cat head and two cat skulls instead of one regular human head, or translucent skin that shows the character's skeleton in order to represent jellyfish. A lot of the Mushroom series has these characters with giant domes on their heads. Sometimes these look like hats, but other times you get characters like this one where there is no head, only shroom. I actually think the cutesy dresses and simple poses are a stroke of genius because it adds another layer of vigilance. Because we are also programmed to notice and love cute things in order to protect them. And tie that in with the attention that we're forced to give the scary, creepy, dark side things, and you have a potent combination of absolutely attention-grabbing design. Despite Linya's characters all being very different from each other, there are a few common anatomical details that I think really drive the story. And like I said, these characters are usually stylized to be appealing in a very cute sense. So you have the usual details like large round eyes placed low on the head, a minimized nose and mouth, large ears placed quite low as well, and a soft round jaw. In fact, even if you don't see most facial features, you will likely at least see the large eyes and the round jaw. And if you've done any amount of stylization whatsoever, you already know these proportions are meant to emulate a baby-like face. However, there are actually also some attributes to how Linnea designs the characters' bodies that further enhances this childlike design. For one, the head is pretty much always disproportionately big, kind of like in toddlers. So the widest part of the face is only slightly smaller than the entire width from shoulder to shoulder. And the head and head accessories form pretty much a quarter of the character's total height. While with the body and the limbs there is usually a narrow top and wide bottom, the head is usually the opposite with a wide top and a narrow bottom. And the head and the body meet at the neck, which is very thin, kind of acting like a fulcrum. This kind of makes you feel like the neck could snap at any moment and you need to protect it, just like you would with a baby. 
Another really interesting detail that I noticed while live streaming the study actually was that Linear often paints the wrists and ankles to actually be very wide and they taper down to the fingers and toes. It's not the usual narrowing we see in realistic wrists or ankles in an adult, but again, it emulates baby fat. Plus, all the lines are very rounded with soft curves and you'll pretty much never see any jagged corners in the anatomy. And like I said, this baby-like stylization really punches up the creepy factor because yeah, ghosts and demons are scary, but what's even scarier? Baby ghosts and demon children. Ever heard of the myth of the black-eyed children? Oh, <laughs> no thank you. <laughs> but again, this is kind of a genius combination because it plays on your instincts. Biologically speaking, we're not meant to think of children as evil or supernatural, and it really grabs your attention and sticks in your memory when you see a character like this where it seems so youthful and innocent, but also ghostly and unnatural. As far as the colours go, Linya often paints elements of glow in her work. Sometimes it is a proper luminescent glow, like you see here in the mushroom cap, where it seems like the green glow is a light source in and of itself. Other times the glow is caused by an external light source, like we see here. But what really makes this glow pop is a twofold contrast. First, of course, we have a strong value contrast. The glowy elements are usually significantly brighter than their surroundings. So here, the green glowy mushrooms stand in stark contrast against the much darker skin, hair, and background. Here, the glow is actually localized to the elbows and thighs and actually contrasts the rest of the body itself. And of course, the mushroom head contrasts the dark cloud around it. But the other element of contrast is the saturation. You'll see that the areas of glow are significantly more saturated than the shadowy areas, except the desaturation is sometimes limited only to areas that are right next to the glow. Then as you go further into the shadow, you see more saturation again. This is the perfect piece to exemplify this. Do you see how there is a warm, saturated glow and then a desaturated, shadowy area? But then going further into the shadow, it becomes more saturated again. Well, it turns out I was mistaken because the area right next to the glow is not straight shadow, it is the mid-tone. However, it looks like a solid shadow tone, which confused me for a bit. Well, as it turns out, there is a third element to the contrast, which is temperature. Most of the time, you'll see that the mid-tone is the area of transition between temperatures. So here, for instance, it looks like the warm highlights are immediately contrasted by cooler, desaturated shadows, and then that goes into a darker, cool, saturated shadow. But in terms of value, that first transition from warm to cool is actually all mid-tone. Here we have a cooler light source which goes into slightly warmer but desaturated mid-tone before hitting a super warm saturated shadow. But as always, the important question is why? Why do a gradual mid-tone transition that is completely disjointed from the highlight like this? The answer, my friend, is drama. By creating a sharp temperature contrast between the highlight and midtone, Linear is able to create what looks like dramatic value contrast while still maintaining what is actually a gentle transition from light to dark. That way, she still creates that incredible eye catching drama between light and shadow, but without losing any of the information in the midtone that would have been lost if she'd painted a dramatic shadow all over the piece. It's a little subtle aspect, but it really has a big impact on the piece as a whole. Oh, and really quickly, I also wanted to mention how pretty much every painting Linnea paints seems to have an underlying tinge of cyan. It could be in the background, in the shadows, or sometimes in the glow itself, but you will almost always find some amount of cyan in her work, and I think it really goes a long way in adding to the undead look of it all.
The rendering is where you really see Linnea's origins as a watercolor artist really shine through because the overall color blocking kind of looks like it's been painted wet on wet where there's these beautiful color blooms that transition values and hues into each other. In fact, the bits of desaturated midtone that we just looked at could also pass for an emulation of when you're painting with watercolors and you just add water to a spot. Like, you know how it causes the pigment to dissipate in those areas? Plus, let's look closer at the texture lines. Not the line art itself, but these little scribbles like you see here. See how they're just the slightest bit translucent? Again, kind of like you'd see with watercolors, but if you are now painting wet on dry. And then of course there is the lines. Do you see how heavily textured they are, especially at the low opacity thinner ends? Kind of like if you were to run a pen on textured paper, such as, oh, I don't know, watercolor paper. Oh yes, it is all coming together. <laughs> One little detail in Linnea's rendering that I absolutely love is when shapes start off hard-edged and high contrast and then gradually disappear into a low contrast blended area. Like here in the hair, I think it's the hair, you see these shapes start with a hard edge at one end and then blend into nothingness at the other end and same with the shadow of the knee here. I love this look so much because it creates hard to soft plane transitions within the same value without using any fancy texture. It's simplification and we love simplification. Then of course you have what looks like a photo texture overlay with this really chunky heavy grain, almost like you see in watercolor paper. See, I research my list jokes well. <laughs> but to sum up part one of this study, here are four key characteristics to Fifal's art. Number one, Linnea is an expert at translating elements of nature into character concepts, but the design often includes dark, macabre storytelling, kind of like how things look scarier at night. Two, pairing dark stories with cutesy anatomy and childlike facial stylization really grabs the viewer's attention because we find creepy children extremely eerie and fascinating. Three, Linnea usually paints a saturated, glowy highlight next to a desaturated midtone of the opposite temperature, which then goes into a saturated shadow. And number four, the rendering is very reminiscent of watercolor painting and the texture overlay further enhances the traditional look. For our study today, this is the absolutely adorable reference that I've chosen. It is a character she created based off the pink oyster mushroom. And I'm sorry, but how could I not do this one? I actually started on the sketch while live with my Discord and Patreon folks, which is why you see my face for the first little bit here. And I can't tell you why the quality of the video is so bad, but oh well. I started with a super rough sketch and while initially it seemed pretty straightforward and I thought I was putting the anatomy down just fine, I quickly realized that the pose and proportions had little subtleties that I was unconsciously exaggerating. Like with the angle of the front leg, for instance. It's actually a lot straighter up, but I had it down at a much more intense angle. And I think the reason for this is partly the anatomy, but also the rendering. So the lack of a narrow ankle means there really isn't a frame of reference for how bent that foot is in comparison to the shin and calf. So that made the angle hard to nail. But then look at the knee. There's rendering there that makes the kneecap stand out, but the line that comes down from the thigh and defines the leg is relatively straight, or like the curve by the knee is very shallow and subtle. Same with the hands. Despite the wrist being rather thick, the hand actually tapers down quite a bit around the fingers, but because there is no narrowing at that wrist joint, it's kind of hard to gauge how big the hand really is. We don't realize just how much we come to rely on these anatomical landmarks for relative size and positions until they're taken away and it's like being lost at sea. <laughs> 
I must say I ended up spending a lot of the total paint time just working on the lines. It could have been faster with the stabilizer on, but I wanted to keep that traditional hand-drawn organic feel that you see in Linear's lines. Once the lines were sorted, however, this piece was an absolute delight to color because it was mostly just rendering in broad shapes. So instead of doing a crazy amount of detailed rendering or texturing at this stage, we've already done it with the lines. I pretty much rendered this entire piece with an airbrush and a hard round brush that has pressure opacity dynamics and maybe a little extra scribbling with a pencil brush. And I must say, once the colors and lighting started to go in, you really start to see the discrepancies in the anatomy. That leg looks even more angled now that it has some dimension, and the character as a whole looks a little wider than she is in the reference, kind of stretched along the x-axis. One interesting thing to note is that Linear uses few specular highlights here, and the ones you do see are nowhere near a bright white. I think this makes the character feel a lot softer and gentler. It's definitely a great tip to carry with you. And finally, after adding the little detailed accents around this character, here is the finished study. What do you think? Okay, so when I was thinking about ideas for this original piece, I looked around my room for cool things that I could turn into a character, and the four fully grown plants aside, the one thing I have a fair few of is candles. And my absolute favorite one is this cappuccino scented candle that I literally love more than I've ever loved actual coffee. And I've loved many a coffee. <laughs> so I thought, hey, what if I turned a candle into a character and she can have like a semi-solid glass cover that's brown like coffee. And yeah, this baby was born. <laughs> For quite a while, as I drew the lines, the bits of molten wax felt gross. But thankfully, the rendering seemed to fix that, I think. We'll see at the end. I thought instead of giving her a regular head and then flames for hair, what if her entire head was the candle's flame like in Elemental? Love that movie by the way, if you haven't watched Pixar's Elemental, you haven't seen character design. But what I really loved about this painting is how it gradually built up over time. I don't know what kind of magic is in Linnea's style, but wow did I have doubts in the early stages, and boy oh boy was I taken aback by how nice the end product turns out. One thing I for sure wanted to keep focus on was the cyan. I made sure there was a pale, desaturated cyan in the shadowy bits of her arms and legs, and you guys, this really did punch up the colour palette. The other thing that really helped was to oversaturate the glowy bits. I don't know if this is a style thing or a candle thing, but saturating the warm tones really seemed to pull this piece together. This is so different from how I usually paint and oh my gosh, I feel like doing this study really unblocked a part of my design brain that was almost chained to realism and yeah, I love this character so much. And there we have it, Fee felt demystified. Man, that shape language caught me completely off guard and it's definitely the thing that's going with me moving forward as an artist. But what was your biggest takeaway from this study? Are there any aspects of Fee Fell's style that I've missed out? Let me know in the comments below. Of course, I've linked all of Linya's work down in the description. Make sure you go check her out and show her some love just in case you haven't already. Um, and if you enjoyed this video and learned something today, please remember to show it some love as well by giving me a big thumbs up and hitting that subscribe button down below because I put out new art-related content every single week. Come say hello on Instagram and Discord, links are down below. And if you'd like to support my channel, grab all of my exclusive rewards that I put out every single week, including the full 4K and 8K resolution versions of my art, all of the speed paints from start to finish, the step-by-step -step progression for every painting, as well as my brush kit for Photoshop and Critter. You can check it all out on my Patreon. I'll leave a link up here. And thank you so much for your support.
Also, I will be live streaming once a month for my patrons, so that's an extra reward as well. Check it out. Now, are there any other artists you'd like to see a style study on in the future? First, check out my style study playlist. I'll leave it here in the outro in just a second. I've done a ton of these, and chances are I've probably covered some of your faves on the series already. But just in case I haven't, feel free to request an artist down in the comments, or better yet, come tell me in my Discord server so it doesn't get lost in the comments below. Yeah, I'll add your artist to my ever growing list, but that's about everything I have to say today. So, thank you guys so so much for hanging out with me i really hope you've enjoyed it as much as i have check out some more style studies down here and i'll see you guys on the next one bye